This is Think Energy, the podcast that helps you better understand the fast-changing world of energy through conversations with game changers, industry leaders, and influencers. So join me, Dan Segan, and my co-host, Rebecca Schwartz, as we explore both traditional and unconventional facets of the energy industry. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Are zero emission vehicles the answer to a stronger economy, cleaner air, a healthier environment, and good jobs? The government of Canada certainly thinks so. And they're not the only ones. EV enthusiasts, owners, experts, and advocates have been mobilizing like never before. They're being driven on a renewed commitment and mandate by the Canadian government to make all light duty vehicle and passenger truck sales fully electric by 2035. A look at the 2022 federal budget shows that considerable money has been earmarked to get more Canadians into the driver's seats of an electric vehicle. According to the government's projections, at least 20% of all new passenger vehicles sold in Canada will be zero emissions by 2026. To give some perspective, last year in 2021, the percentage of zero emission vehicles sold in Canada was 5.2%. That gives five years for the government to reach its target. Doable? Well, since there's a rising trend in the demand of electric vehicles, many companies have actually gone out of stock. Automobile makers are experiencing a shortage in their EVs and thus putting customers on waiting lists because of this high demand. Some manufacturers aren't even taking new orders for the foreseeable future because they just can't keep up. So here's today's big question. Despite the momentum, are the real needs, issues and concerns by EV enthusiasts, owners, experts and advocates being addressed and setting the stage? For success. Our guest today is Daniel Breton, the president and CEO of Electric Mobility Canada, one of the oldest associations dedicated to the electrification of transportation in the world. Electric Mobility Canada members include vehicle manufacturers, electricity suppliers, universities, tech companies, environmental NGOs, and many more. Daniel's background includes serving as Quebec's Minister of the Environment, Sustainable Development, Wildlife and Parks. He was also the first elected official to oversee a government strategy for the electrification of transportation in Canada in 2012. Daniel, thank you for joining us on the program today for what's a very busy week for you. To kick things off, can you tell us a bit about Electric Mobility Canada its mandate, and what drove you to the organization? Well, uh, EMC's mandate, EMC being one of the oldest organizations in the world dedicated to electric mobility, uh, its mandate is basically to accelerate uh, electric mobility of all sorts. So we're not just talking cars, but we're talking buses, we're talking trucks, we're talking off-road, marine, uh, so we have a growing, diversified membership. Uh, so now we do have bolt makers and bus makers and truck makers and mining companies and uh, research centers and tech companies. So uh, so that that's it. So our mission is really to accelerate electric mobility in all forms and shapes. Um, I would say that. Um, Electric mobility is um, growing really fast these days around the world. And we also want to make sure that while we want to accelerate electric mobility to lower greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution, we also want to make sure that we create jobs in the process. So uh, to me, we want to make sure that we have an EV supply chain that's made in Canada, that we don't just end up extracting critical minerals in Canada to send elsewhere in the world, like we have done so many times in the past. We want to develop our own industry, and this is happening right now. Uh, Obviously, 
We do a lot of networking amongst members, and we have our conference, you know, happening uh, from September 27th to 29th. And uh, we talk a lot to federal government, provincial governments, cities, some of which are members, a new member being the city of Toronto. Uh, So, yeah, so that's what I do uh, on a full-time basis. That's what I've been doing for decades, actually. And we have a growing team, growing membership. So we're, it's really exciting, actually. What's been the most significant event, innovation, or policy that you think has changed the future trajectory for mass EV adoption for the better? Well, uh, I think there's not one thing in particular, you know, that, it may, that has made it possible. I would say that it's a growing or it's a... It's a, a number of things so obviously battery technology has evolved quickly over the past 10 15 20 years just to give you an example between 2008 and 2020 uh volume density of battery has grown eightfold so uh when you look at batteries today you have you can have a lot more capacity in a battery now than you had five years ago ten years ago and it's going to keep growing as time goes by. A lot of people seem to think that if you have, let's say, a 60 kilowatt hour battery, it's going to be four times the size than a 15 kilowatt hour battery from, let's say, 2010. Actually, it's not the case at all. It's just that it has cap- more capacity and a smaller volume per kilowatt hour, meaning that uh, actually weight has not increased as fast as capacity. So to me, that's very important. The other thing is that infrastructure uh, <clears throat> infrastructure deployment and infrastructure uh, evolution has made a big difference. Just to give you an example, uh, 10 years ago, the average electric car had 120 kilometers of range. Now it's 450. So in 10 years, it's quadrupled. At the same time, 10 years ago, if you wanted to charge your electric car, there was hardly any fast chargers on the road. So, for example, when I was working in Montreal and I had to go to the National Assembly, I could not buy an electric car. I had to buy a plug-in hybrid electric car because there was no fast charger between Montreal and Quebec. That's 10 years ago. Now, if you go five years ago, a fast charger had a 50-kilowatt charger. So that meant that we went from charging 120 kilometers of range in about four or five hours to charging 120 120 kilometers of range in about half an hour. And now with new fast chargers, you know, when, you know, going from 50 kilowatt to 150 kilowatt, 250 kilowatt, and even 350 kilowatt, you can charge 120. 120 kilometers of range in 10 minutes. So so things have accelerated regarding the technology of infrastructures as well. Education is making a big difference because more and more people are interested in EVs. There's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Uh, I'm often surprised to hear the same questions I was being asked 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago regarding battery life, for instance, but I still do get those questions on social media and even sometimes on regular media. On the other hand, what do you consider to be the most significant setback or barrier to the mass adoption of electric vehicles? Feel free to speak to Canada in general or more specifically of right here in Ontario. I would say uh, it's uh, education and training and supply. So that's the the three things, the three issues, the roadblocks. First of all, Supply. I mean, most EVs nowadays, you have to wait between six months and three years to get your hands on one. So that's a real issue. Uh, we are uh, supporting the federal government and its will to adopt a federal ZEV mandate uh, to make sure that we have more and more supply of electric cars across the country. But in Ontario in particular, uh, I don't know if you remember this, but 11 years ago, the federal government and the Ontario government announced joint support for the assembly of the Toyota RAV4 EV. So both of them 
uh, gave $70 million to assemble the Toyota RAV4 electric in Woodstock, Ontario. Because there was no regulation, no mandate in Ontario or in Canada for that matter, but because there was a mandate in California, and you have to keep in mind that back then there was a rebate of up to $8,500 in Ontario, even with the rebate, 100% of these Toyota RAV4 EVs were sent to the U.S. So you could live two kilometers away from the plant. You could not buy one. So considering that now the federal government and the Ontario government have invested billions of dollars into the assembly of either vehicles or batteries or cathodes or anodes across the country, we think that... Uh, as that mandate is really, really super important for Ontario citizens because it would be a shame that we, yet again, we would assemble electric vehicles in, in Ontario. But because there are ZEV mandates in 15 U.S. states plus two Canadian provinces, well, most, if not all, of these electric vehicles assembled in Ontario would be sent elsewhere. So that's the first thing. The other thing is education. There is so much work that needs to be done. I mean, there is so there is so much disinformation or bad information, you know, going around in regular media. I mean, I read regular media on a daily basis about electric vehicles in English Canada, and I'm stunned to see how many bad articles are written on electric vehicles. It's really bad. I mean... It used to be like that in Quebec, not so much anymore. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. And training, training for people who work in the auto industry. Um, I, 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 I did some training last year for a car manufacturer whose name I won't mention, but I was surprised to see how little they knew, not only about the ecosystem, I mean, the chargers, the apps, uh, the networks, but about their own product. I mean, I was teaching engineers at this manufacturer about their car so to me it shows how much work that there is still to do regarding the ev ecosystem i often say when we're talking about electric vehicles that when someone drives a gas car and wants to go to an electric car it's like saying i've never owned a boat i'm going to buy a boat but there are a lot of different regulations when you are on the water because it's a different world. Well, it's a bit the same when you're talking about electric cars because there are new things you need to learn about. In particular, range, uh, the way you use them on a daily basis, winter driving, charging, obviously. So yeah, so education and training, I think is super important and it's a roadblock right now. Now, Daniel, what is your opinion of the adoption rate so far in Canada? Which provinces or territories or even companies uh, are doing the best job at building an EV movement? Well, I would say that uh, provinces, uh, obviously, BC and Quebec are ahead of the curve. When you look at the Q1 EV sales number uh, for Canada, while in Canada, we were at 7.7% EV sales, according to StatsCan. Um, in BC, they were at 15.5%. So that, that's twice the national rate. And in Quebec, they were at 12.7%. At the meantime, Ontario was at 5.3%. So that, that shows that you need to have rebates. I think rebates are important, which you don't have anymore in Ontario, but you have to have mandates as well. <clears throat> Let me give you a perfect example of that. In BC, uh, the rebate is up to $4,000. In PEI and New Brunswick, it's $5,000. But because they have no mandate there, they have no supply. So their, their EV sales are below 5%. So I think it's very important to have both rebates and mandates. Regarding companies, obviously, Tesla is driving the charge. I mean, uh, it's obvious if you look at uh, if uh, if things keep uh, rolling out like we are seeing today, the Tesla Model Y will be the best-selling gas or electric vehicle in the world next year. 
I mean, this is no small feat. Uh, so yeah, so Tesla's making a huge difference. Tesla is a member of EMC, by the way. Uh, but we are seeing that some Korean manufacturers like Kia and Hyundai are coming up with very interesting products. And uh, I'm stunned to say this, but I think that the Japanese are being left in the dust by even the Americans. And this is something I would have never predicted five or 10 years ago. Uh, we are seeing <clears throat> that there seems to be a lot of resistance uh, on the part of Japanese manufacturers. And uh, to me, being old enough to remember, it looks to me a bit like what I saw in the 80s and the 90s when the Japanese came really strong to the market and they left the, the American manufacturers behind. So I think the Japanese manufacturers, not all of them, but most of them are going to have to wake up because right now they're really lagging behind. So we recently had Lauren McDonald on the show, and he talked about how consumers need to shift the way that they think about EVs. He said that EVs are more like a smartphone that you charge every night and less like a traditional gas car that you head to the pumps for. Do you agree with that? And if you have a story or anecdote that you'd like to share, we'd love to hear it. So, uh, well, I mean, obviously, EVs are becoming more and more like regular vehicles, because if you go back five or 10 years ago, as I mentioned, you know, a regular EV that was not a $100,000 EV had between 120 and 150 kilometers of range. So it was a very different story then. My girlfriend still drives one of those EVs. I mean, she drives a, a smart 4.2 electric. It has 100 kilometers of range. It doesn't even have fast charging. So, so when she goes on the road, she she's aware of the way that this vehicle behaves and the range that she can have winter or summer. But keep in mind that most Canadians, most families have more than one car nowadays. So I would say that the first EV, which would be like the family EV, which can be either a car, an SUV, or even a pickup truck, uh, is the one that you're going to use when you go traveling, when you go on a trip, when you go to see the family. And, uh, and that one is the one that you drive every day because you use every day. The second one, if you have a second car, it can be a smaller EV or a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Uh, and, and I always suggest to people not to buy two big cars with two big batteries. I think it's a waste from an economic point of view and environmental point of view. So, uh, so if you want to talk about anecdotes i remember when my girlfriend first got her car i mean i remember the second or the third night we went to a drive-in movie and the range were the, the range that she had left was about 25 kilometers and and you have to to plug the vehicle you know you have to connect to the radio to hear the movie and she was honestly she was freaking out because she said i'm not gonna have enough range to go back we can't watch the all of the movie uh so we did not we ended up going back home before the end of the movie it took her i would say a couple of weeks before she got used to the range of her vehicle keep in mind that it doesn't have a lot of range now that she knows how the car behaves she's not stressed anymore one thing that happens to all of us is at one point we forget to charge the car or to plug the car at night, you know? It happens to us once or twice, but most of the time, then you remember. It's like your phone. You know, one night you'll come back home, you're tired, you don't plug the phone. The next morning you say, oh my God, I have no, I have no capacity. There's, there's no range. So uh, that's the type of thing that you learn from. Uh, it happens to you a couple of times and then you learn, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> Um, what do you think are the biggest social drivers for the recent uptick in EVs? Um, is it really the high price of gas or is it connected to something bigger? I think uh, it's a few things. I think first, ga gas prices have made a huge difference because people are seeing that there's a really, <clears throat> it's really interesting to buy an electric car with those gas prices. But more than that, the fact 
that there are more and more chi- choices of different models and shapes of EVs, you know, with the new F-150 Lightning coming to market, you know, the Kia EV6, the Hyundai Ioniq 5, these are really appealing vehicles. So I think that choice and and price is making a big difference. Uh, I mean, I, I'm sure you saw that, but a couple of weeks ago, GM announced that they were coming up with their new Equinox EV starting at $35,000. And uh, I don't know if you know this, but uh, I just saw the price for the base Honda CRV. It's $36,000. So now if you look at small SUV electric, small SUV gas, without the rebate, the small SUV, the CRV, is even more expensive than the base version of the Equinox EV. So even though people say prices of EV keep going up and up and up, it's not necessarily true. It depends on the model. Yes, some people do want more expensive electric car, but let's be honest here. <clears throat> you know many people who buy the base model of any vehicle, gas or electric? It doesn't happen. It just doesn't. So I would say that prices of vehicles have gone up, way up actually, gas or electric, but we are seeing at the same time some very competitive models in on the EV side, especially from GM, and I have to salute them for that. I've got a follow-up question here for you. What are some of the overall benefits as a nation when we reach 100% EV passenger sales by 2030 and all other vehicles by 2040? Well, I would say that the first benefit is lower G emissions. It's going to make a hell of a difference because, uh, you know, a lot of people say that... Um, GHG emissions from transportation represent 24% of Canada's total GHG emissions, but that's only downstream emissions. When you add upstream emissions, it's 30%, meaning that transportation is the number one source of GHG emissions in Canada. So that's GHG emissions. So lowering them by, I would say, 50 to 80%, because you have to keep in mind that you have GHG emissions from electricity production, although it's getting much better. I mean, the last coal plant is going to close next year in Alberta. And uh, and uh, Nova Scotia intends to go, I think it's 80% renewable by 2030. So uh, as time goes by, electric vehicles become cleaner and cleaner because the grid is becoming cleaner and cleaner. So that's one thing. But the other thing, which is super important, and people seem to forget, is that um, according to Health Canada, they released a report on the impact of air pollution last year. The economic cost of air pollution is estimated at $120 billion, not millions, billions. $120 $120 billion from air pollution, and that's 15,300 premature deaths, which is eight times the death toll of car accidents. So if we bring more electric vehicles on the road, it's going to lower significantly air pollution, whether it's from light-duty vehicles or medium or heavy-duty vehicles. So it's going to save billions of dollars to Canadians, help our healthcare system, and save thousands of lives. I mean, this is not insignificant. This is very important. And uh, this is something I think that needs to be said. And last but not least, jobs. I've been talking about this, believe it or not. I've been coming to the House of Commons because from where I am, I can see the House of Commons right here because I'm in Gatineau this morning. Um, I started to talk about the EV industry about 15 or 16 years ago to the federal government saying that we need to transition our automotive sector from gas to electric because that's where the industry is going. So there was really not much of any interest uh, for years, but now the federal government has really caught on. I have to salute Minister Champagne for his leadership on this particular issue uh, to make sure to attract Uh, EV assembly, battery assembly, battery manufacturing, critical mineral strategy. So we are seeing a real shift. I mean, you have to keep in mind that between 2000 and 2020, uh, uh, 
light duty vehicle production in Canada has been going down and down and down time and time again. We went from fourth biggest manufacturer in the world to not even be in the top 10 in 2020. Now, because the federal government, the Ontario government, the Quebec government, and other Canadian governments are investing more and more on the EV supply chain in the EV industry, we are seeing a revival of the automotive sector in Ontario. And to me, this is significant. And uh, if we hadn't done this, there would not be an automotive sector by 2030 or 2035. So this is huge. Electric Mobility Canada recently launched a 2030 EV action plan with the goal of highlighting how we get to an EV future by 2030. So what is this and what was involved in its creation? Uh, well, most members of EMC were involved with the, uh, in the creation of the 2030 EV action plan. So uh, it meant, you know, manufacturers, it meant uh, infrastructure providers, utilities, research centers. So, I mean, we have a large pool of very qualified, experienced uh, people who are either staff or on our board, on our JR committee, on our MHDV working group, our battery working group, uh, our utilities working group. So all of these minds come together to say, this is what we recommend for the future of Canada regarding e-mobility. So, uh, so yeah, so it was a broad consultation amongst ourselves to see what kind of policies we could put in place to accelerate EV adoption. Um, and um, I would say that the result has been significant because we have seen a lot of interest from the federal government, amongst others, uh, regarding our recommendation, whether it was for, uh, I'll give you an example. At the end of July, I was invited by Minister Algabra's cabinet to be at his announcement for their new uh, medium and heavy duty uh, vehicle incentive program because we basically wrote the program, we sent it to them, we had some exchanges, and they said, this does make sense, and we learned from other programs elsewhere in the world or elsewhere in Canada. So, uh, I mean, it is significant. We're talking about more than half a billion dollars to accelerate EV adoption regarding medium and heavy-duty vehicles. Obviously, the infrastructure deployment program, almost a billion dollars, uh, is something that's going to make a big difference to accelerate EV adoption. This was also part of our recommendation in the 2030 EV Action Plan. and uh, But we're not stopping there. To us, the 2030 EV Action Plan was, uh, was an important, I would say, um, moment in the EMC's history. But we are coming up with newer, updated, revised recommendations, new documents uh, being published. So this is a, you know, this is a work in progress. Okay, great. We're going to discuss the six pillars of the plan today, which I think covers a lot of the issues and concerns raised by many Canadians. Let's dig into pillar number one, light duty EV consumer adoption. Some of the highlights under this pillar include price parity with gas cars, some clever incentive proposal and removing caps for taxis and ride-sharing companies to move fully electric. Can you talk to some of these and what your ultimate goal with this pillar is? Well, this pillar is to not only encourage EV adoption, but discourage gas guzzler adoption. Because uh, uh, we have what we call, you know, the fee-bait system that we recommend. Uh, I've been talking about this for more than 10 years. Uh, because at, while people are buying more and more EVs at the same time, they're buying more and more light trucks, gas light trucks. And this is an issue because uh, we see that, you know, what most manufacturers offer now is more and more SUVs, pickup trucks, and crossovers. So cars are less and less bought by Canadians because they are less and less manufacturers by OEMs. You know, if you go to a Toyota dealer, there's no Honda Fit anymore. There's no Yaris anymore. But there's more and more of those SUVs. So so uh, for us, the fee-based system 
I think is a recommendation that's important, but it's not an easy one to adopt. We have not seen anyone in North America adopt the fee-based system yet. We, it has shown to be very uh, effective in uh, Europe, but it's, it's an issue. And you know, in North America and Canada, and Canada in particular, uh, when we're one thing that I'm really uh, focusing on is the fact that for us it doesn't make sense that you know uh, car sharing companies, car pooling companies, would have a cap of ten vehicles uh, that can get the federal rebate because. Not only do we want to encourage the transition to EVs, but especially in downtown areas, we want to make sure that if people don't don't need to buy a car and they can use a car sharing service, well, they should be encouraged to do so. And the car sharing services should be encouraged to electrify their fleet. So for us, this cap has to go. Uh, this is something I've been discussing with people in the federal government, and uh, we are coming up with more data and information, you know, explaining why we need this. Uh, other than that, you know, you, we are talking about EV rebate for uh, for used vehicles. Uh, this is actually in one of the mandate letters, and it has been in the, in the mandate letters for a number of years now at the federal level. The program has still not been put together. So we are anxiously waiting to see what's going to happen with this. And last but not least, I don't know if you know about this, but in California, there is a particular rebate on top of the regular rebate for low-income uh, individuals and families who want to buy an electric car. So we think that this is something important for people who have, you know, who are not as affluent to be able to buy an electric car. So, Daniel, in Pillar 2, you discuss medium, heavy-duty, and off-road fleet electrification and a number of rebates, tax credits, and offsetting costs for electrical infrastructure. What are some of the key takeaways, and what about the tolls and restrictions for large polluters? Can you speak to that a little bit? Well, I would say that uh, what we are seeing because of uh, this very important announcement from Minister Algabra this summer what we are seeing now is that the main issue or the main challenge is infrastructure. Let's say you are a, a transit agency and you want, want to buy a you know whole fleet of electric buses, you have to charge them. And the garages that we have in Canada have not been you know planned this way, so we have to really either adapt them or build new garages. But this is something that can be done. I mean, right now, there's less than 1,000 electric buses in Canada, closer to 600. In China, they have more than 600,000 electric buses. And uh, I, was, I was told a few years ago by someone from a tra transit agency whose name I won't mention, that because in this particular city that this person worked in, uh, Population density made it harder for them to electrify buses. So I couldn't help but reply that, uh, yes, because China, as we all know, does have a lot of people. So so, so to me, it was, it was not an argument. I mean, if you want to plan this, you find a way. I mean, this, you know, there's this saying, you know, if if you want to do it, you find a way. If you don't want to do it, you find an excuse. So to me. This is really a challenge regarding, uh, you know, transit fleets. If we're talking about trucks, uh, well, depot charging is going to be very important. But uh, right now, this is not something that's been planned or budgeted in uh, the federal government's programs. So we are looking to try and recommend to the government that we put together a particular program for medium and heavy duty vehicle infrastructure. This is something that we that needs to be done. And regarding off-road vehicles. So off-road vehicle is a different issue because a lot of people seem to think that if you buy a snowmobile or a sea or a side-by-side, -side, that it's just for fun. But a lot of people work with these snowmobiles and sea and side-by-side -side because they work in a park. They work at a ski station. They work on a construction site. 
So keep in mind that a regular modern snowmobiles pollutes as much, talking about air pollution here, as 40 modern cars, gas cars. So from an air pollution point of view, it's a big win for people to adopt electric off-road vehicles. So that's why we are pushing for that as well. Not to mention the fact that some of the companies making those side-by-sides and snowmobiles are Canadian companies. So it's not only good for the air pollution, but it's also good for job creation as well and expertise. I mean, after all, I mean, where else than in Canada should we have electric snowmobiles to start with? I mean, it should be starting here. And it is starting here. Okay, at least one third of Canadians live in multi-unit residential buildings today. Under pillar number three, you go into some details about the National EV Infrastructure Deployment Plan. What are the targets and recommendations you believe are needed when it comes to public charging and making condos and apartments EV ready? Well, <clears throat> there needs to be some regulation uh, put together either by provinces or cities to accelerate EV adoption in MERBs, you know, multi-unit residential buildings. Uh, actually, I learned just a few days ago that uh, the city of Laval in Quebec has put together an EV-ready regulation. That's just something we are seeing in BC, and this is something we should see across the board, across the country, because it's not just about, you know, incentives uh, for people to install EV chargers in condominiums because some some uh, condo owners, you know, their uh, their syndicate, uh, they simply don't want that. They don't allow for that to to be able to you know for people to install them. So we think that there needs to be regulation so that you know there should be a right to charge, and this is something very important. Uh, we are asking the federal government, but other governments as well to make sure that at least uh, we have at least a million chargers in MERBs by 2030 across the country. Um, we think it's very important because yes, public charging is key, but let's face it, 80 to 90% of charging happens where? At home or at work. So if we have both public chargers and MERB chargers and home chargers, this is the only way we're going to be able to reach our targets regarding EV adoption. Okay, here's a follow-up question for you, Danielle. Where do you see utilities playing a role in the 2030 EV action plan? They will play a big role. I mean, they have so much to win from EV transition that it's really surprising that some uh, utilities don't see the interest. I wouldn't say that Canadian utilities don't see the interest. I would say that most of them do. Most utilities in Canada are members of EMC. We have a utilities working group. They are looking at ways to help this transition, both from a technological point of view, from a planning point of view, and from a regulatory point of view. So they do play a big role. But uh, I was part of a discussion uh, last year with uh, people in the Ontario government because a lot of people in government were saying, how much is this uh, infrastructure deployment going to cost uh, you know, people in Ontario and utilities? And I said, uh, I asked this, a question to a person from the, federal go- from the Ontario government. I said to them, do you know how much it costs you to import oil to make diesel and uh, gas in Ontario on a monthly basis? And that person said no. So uh, I looked at how much Ontario uh, cars and trucks consume on a monthly basis. And I made a calculation at $60 a barrel, which was lower a year ago, you know. And back then, it added up to $1.2 billion a month. So if you take that $1.2 billion a month that just flies out of Ontario because Ontario is not a province that produces oil and you bring it back in and you put that money into infrastructure and jobs and electricity production, 
from Ontario Utilities, it's a lot more money that stays in Ontario. $1.2 billion a month is a lot of money. So that means that we Ontario does have the means to electrify its fleet and to uh, update and, uh, yeah, to update its grid. Next, what are the benefits to the government launching a national 2030 EV strategy and regulation? And why is this so important? Well, that's something that we are seeing already, you know, with the very important announcement that have been made by uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, Minister Champagne, uh, Minister Wilkinson. Because keep in mind that when we're talking about create job creation in, uh, in the EV sector, it's not just about car assembly or truck assembly or bus assembly. It's also about infrastructure manufacturing. You know, whether we're talking about uh, level two chargers, you know, uh, the main sponsor of our 2022 conference is Grizzly, which is a company based in Ontario. And they make residential chargers, but they're going to start making public chargers and they're doing it a way that's very efficient so that's job creation as well uh where we're talking about construction jobs for those infrastructures where we're talking about mining jobs and processing jobs so uh there was a report released by uh the international energy agency a few days ago that said that stated that right now in canada We are right now about at 50-50 when we're talking about the percentages of job in fossil fuel versus renewables and electric mobility. And that's in 2022. But we all know that between now and 2030, the number of jobs created in renewables and green mobility is going to be much higher than in fossil fuels. So this is very important. We're talking job creation, you know, from the whole spectrum, well, from mining to mobility. Okay, so a quick follow-up for you, though. A couple of items under the fourth pillar that we found to be interesting was the Green Scrap It program and your recommendation to help rural northern First Nations and Inuit communities. Can you briefly talk about those and your rationale? Uh, well, the Green Scrap It program is inspired by stuff that we are seeing, that we have seen in Quebec and BC, because uh, what we are saying is that for people who drive older vehicles, whether it's for individual cars or old buses, for instance, because some of those buses have been on the road for a long time and their pollution levels are through the roof. So we want to help either its companies, individuals, or transit authorities school boards to transition to electric vehicles, whether it's, you know, cars, trucks, buses, school buses. Uh, But it's a way for us to make sure that we do accelerate the transition. But regarding individual vehicles, what we are saying is that we should accelerate scrappage program. But what some people are saying in the industry is that people should, you know, just get rid of the their old car and be able to buy a new car and it could be a gas car. So we don't agree with that. But not only that, um, when people, let's say somebody gets rid of his or her Honda Civic and decides to buy a brand new Honda CRV, well, air pollution is going to be lower, but GHG emissions are going to be higher because it's a bigger car and GHG emissions are directly linked to uh, fuel consumption. So it's not because you buy a new car that necessarily it's that good for the environment. So that's why we are saying a scrap it program should be linked either to the purchase of an electric vehicle, but it can also be a transit pass. It can be an electric bike. It can be a car sharing service, carpooling service, because yes, electric mobility is a key ingredient in the solution to lower GHG emissions when we're talking about transportation, but it's not the only one. So that's why, because I've been working at this for decades, I know that we have to also encourage you know, uh, collective transportation, active transportation, car sharing, carpooling, uh, commute work. All of this is part of the solution when we're trying to find not only ways to lower GHG emissions, but to lower traffic congestion as well. Regarding First Nations and remote communities, 
I live in the country. I don't live in downtown Montreal because we hear that very often, you know. Oh, yeah, electric cars are only good for those who live in the city and try, you know, a commute around the city. Well, actually, when you look at the Cape, at the Quebec data, 75% of EV owners in Quebec live outside of Quebec and Montreal. Why? For a very simple reason. Because they have either a garage or a driveway. It's a lot easier to plug your car when you have a garage or a driveway than when you live in a burb. I'm sure you know this as well as I do. But for those who live further down, you know, let's say you live in northern Saskatchewan or northern Ontario, and you say, well, it's going to be really hard for me uh, to be able to have access to an electric car or to, to drive the long distances that we need to drive when we, lay, we live uh, far away. Uh, well, first of all, there seems to be some misconception about the fact that Canada is a big country. And therefore, we drive a lot. We do a lot of mileage. That's just not true, okay? The average driving from Canadians on a daily basis to go to work and back, 80% of Canadians drive 60 kilometers or less to go to work and back. So what that means is that, no, it's actually 80 kilometers and back, 80 kilometers to go to work and back. So. But this is very important because most Canadians don't drive that much. I mean, the average uh, driving habits of Canadians from the latest data, which is not new by any means, because the latest data that we found from the federal government was 2009, believe it or not. This is so outdated, I can't believe it. But anyway, we were at 17,000 kilometers approximately. So 17,000 kilometers is not that much driving. I mean, I because I travel a lot for my work, I drive more than 50,000 kilometers a year. So having an electric car and driving a lot is no issue. What we need is to make sure that remote communities have access to chargers, fast chargers in particular. When you get out of the 401, the 417, the 15, the Trans-Canadian, when you go more up north, it is an issue for many regions in Canada, especially when you live in the prairies. Uh, I've heard some people, you know, look for chargers. They didn't know where they were because no one explained to them where to plug the vehicle. There were only level two chargers. So infrastructure is a real issue. Uh, for those who really live, you know, outside of most of the grid, you know, when you live uh, in Nunavut or Nunavik or, you know, Yukon or Northwest Territories, uh, there are more and more chargers being deployed. And very often, people who live there buy SUVs or pickup trucks. So now that we're seeing more and more SUVs and pickup trucks coming to market, it's becoming less of a challenge, but they do need to get them delivered over there. That's the first thing. The, uh, the second thing for those who would be, I would say, uh, more anxious about the fact that when it's minus 30, minus 40, you, know, you lose up to 50% in range. Worst comes to worst, you can always buy a plug-in hybrid electric vehicle. Mean, meaning that, you know, you're going to have some range, especially in the summer. In the winter, not so much so. But uh, but the truth of the matter is that, you know, I've been driving EVs for, I've been driving partial and full EVs for 23 years now. So uh, I know that even at minus 20, I've been going to Saguenay. Actually, we organized an, an EV day in Saguenay in January at minus 25, minus 30, where 20 of us from AVEC, I was with AVEC back then, we drove all the way up there and uh, and no one had an issue. You just need to have the infrastructure and that's an issue right now in, in Northern Ontario, it is an issue. And we are seeing that in Northern provinces who are not BC and Quebec, I would say. When it comes to federal leadership with respect to EVs in your sixth and last pillar, what is the government doing right? And what are your recommendations for improvement? Well, I would say that uh, what the government is doing right for EV adoption at the federal level is that uh, they are helping more and more departments buy EVs. Uh, so to me, this is, this is key. But we need to install a lot more chargers in federal buildings and federal parkings that we have right now. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, I'm right across the river from the House of 
Commons. And I think that I see like less than 10 chargers at the House of Commons. To me, this is far from being enough. Uh, when I was in Norway in June, we went to a city called Arendal, about 300 kilometers away from Oslo. And it's a small city, 40,000 people. And there was an underground parking over there that could accommodate about 150 cars. There were 70 chargers. <laughs> so, so we have a lot of catching up to do. Let's put it that way. And on that topic, I have to mention this. Uh, when I was in government, in, in my government plan for the government of Quebec 10 years ago, we had a plan to electrify ferries. So when we lost our election, you know, the, the, the electrification of ferry fell, you know, in the cracks. When I was in Norway in June, <clears throat> I learned that there's 100, 825 ferries in Norway. 825, 825 ferries in Norway. 400 of those, 400 of those ferries are already electric. And the largest electric ferry in Norway can accommodate 600 people and 200 cars. So I think that if the Canadian government wanted to electrify its ferry lines, uh, it would be a great opportunity for the marine industry in Canada to develop a new skill and create a whole new industry, actually. So something that I thought was fascinating in this pillar was the zero emission zone in downtown Ottawa. Can you tell us what that is and why you recommended it or called out Ottawa specifically? Well, I think it's because it's a symbol. I mean, Ottawa is the capital of Canada. So if we have a zero emission zone in Ottawa, I think it will send a strong signal that people could not drive gas or diesel vehicle in that particular area. Okay, Danielle, we always end our interviews with some rapid fire questions. And we have a few for you. Are you ready? Go ahead. Okay, here's number one. What are you reading right now? Oh, my God. Uh, that's funny because, uh, you know, uh, I used to read a lot of novels when I was younger. Now all I read is reports. <laughs> I, need I read battery reports and I need books and I read everything related to electric mobility, uh, the oil industry, energy transition. So basically, most of the reading that I do is scientific or economic. That's that's my bed, bedtime reading, yeah. Okay. What would you name your boat if you had one? I don't have one because I'm an old-time windsurfer. So I, I live, I mean, my house is by the St. Lawrence River, so I windsurf in my backyard. So, and I don't intend to have a boat, but I, I keep windsurfing, even though I turned 60 this year, I want to die windsurfing. <laughs> I want to windsurf until I die. So, yeah. Moving on to the next one. Who is someone that you admire? Oh, well, I admire a lot of people. Um, uh, it's hard to tell, uh, because I mean, so many people that I admire, I mean, Believe it or not, my I I, mean, I said my girlfriend, but my wife, because I got married two weeks, three weeks ago. Um, thanks. Uh, she met with the Dalai Lama a few years ago because she used to be a member of parliament and she was the only Buddhist member of parliament. So she met with the Dalai Lama. So that's a person that I really admire. Nelson Mandela, I really admire, obviously. Being from Quebec, René Lévesque, you, know, you have to keep in mind that René Lévesque has done a lot. For those who are in Ontario, you know, a lot of people think about independence. But when I think about René Lévesque, I think about Maître Chinou when he was natural resources minister. And uh, and uh, they held a, a referendum election on the nationalization of electricity in 1962. And that helped propel Hydro-Québec from a small company to a, one of the biggest forces in the world regarding electricity production and clean electricity production for that matter. So Jean Lesage and René Lévesque are really important in my mind, uh, I would say. And uh, 
even though he is controversial, I would say Elon Musk. You know, I mean, he's done so much and he is such a leader and uh, and new ways of doing things. But I don't always agree with him. But I have to say that when you work in electric mobility, if it was, if it was not for him, we would not be there today. What is the closest thing to real magic that you've witnessed? That's a good question. Real closest thing to real magic, I would say uh, it, that it was uh, the night that I saw an aurora borealis. It's very spectacular. Okay, let's move on here. What has been the biggest challenge to you personally since the pandemic began? To me personally, uh, I mean, a lot of people close to me have caught COVID. My mother's caught COVID. She's been very sick. Um, so many people close to me either were really sick. Uh, a friend of mine, you know, fell in a coma for almost 20 days. So I thought he was going to die. Uh, another friend of mine, 52 years old, died from COVID. So, uh, so this is, at, you know, this at home, really hard. From an EMC point of view, keep in mind that I started at EMC on March 9th, 2020. And, uh, And the first thing that I did as CEO of EMC was to cancel our conference. So my first decision was to cancel a very important event for EMC for its members. And I remember I canceled it like March 15th, like a week after I had come in. So people were really not sure about what I was doing. I said, who's this new guy canceling the conference? Uh, is he nuts? But I was just you know, in front of the curve. So it was complicated for us because since I would say that I was pretty much the only one to cancel an event of any big event or conference in 2020, I had a lot of issues with hotels and people that we paid for because they said, not going to happen. What you're saying doesn't make sense. These events will happen. Uh We don't want to reimburse you. So we had to fight for months and months uh, to get our money back because at one point, everybody came to the conclusion that there was no other way around this. But uh, it was a couple of months that were really very hard. I can tell you that. We've all been watching a lot of Netflix or TV lately. What's your favorite movie or show? Right now. I watched a series called uh, Casa de Pape. It, it's a, it's a Spanish TV series. Uh, it's it's super weird, but it's very interesting. Uh, um, and uh, and the other one that I've been watching recently, because keep in mind that my wife is Vietnamese, so it's a show called I think Career Plan or something like that about an Asian woman who is a lawyer. And it's it's her career and it's her path in life. And my girlfriend is a career woman. She's been very successful. So this is something that we watch together. Okay, lastly, what's exciting you about your industry right now? Oh, my God. Uh, I would say that it's just... this. Uh, listen, I've been talking about EVs and EV adoption and EV industry for decades now. So for for many years, I felt like I was, you know, this nutcase, you know, that walks around, you know, the cities, you know, uh, repent, the end is near, you know, I felt like, <laughs> because I was talking about, I was talking about, you know, climate change, because I studied in climate change. That's what I studied in when I was in university. So to me, at one point around 2005 or so, I said, we have to talk. We, I have to stop talking only about depressing stuff and start talking about solutions. And that's when in 2005, I said, I have to make it uh, a goal of mine to find ways to accelerate EV adoption. That was 17 years ago. I created MCN21 back then. I uh, wrote books on the subject. I've written many books on the subject. But still, until five years ago, I mean, there were only a few of us. Now that we are seeing car manufacturers, truck manufacturers, plane manufacturers, uh, you know, jumping and jumping on the bandwagon of electric mobility. It's very exciting. And uh, 
I mean, I didn't even take a vacation this summer because there was so much jobs, so many consultations, so many reports, so much stuff to do. So uh, at one point, I said that to a, a federal employee. I said, you know, who? I mean, I would be nuts to complain because I have too much work because I've been asking for this for many years. But uh, I would say the most exciting thing is just the vibe. You know, it's just, it's just that. I mean. It's a hot topic nowadays. Uh, I mean, just two years ago, uh, because I've been, I've been, I'm well known in Quebec. A lot of people know me. People, I know people. People know me. I'm all over the media. But in the rest of Canada, it was not such a hot topic to talk about electric mobility until maybe a year ago, two years ago, the most. But now, every week, you know. Uh, I'm not the only one, but a lot of people now do interviews about electric mobility, electric cars and the chargers. And some of those articles, as I mentioned, are really bad. But I mean, we are talking more and more about this. So the whole excitement, you know, about this transition, I think is is uh, is very encouraging. And I know that uh, all of us will have works for decades to come because uh, this is only the beginning. All right, Daniel. Well, that's it. We've reached the end of another episode of the Think Energy podcast. But before we go, if our listeners want to learn more about you and your organization, how can they connect? Well, uh, they can go to our website, you know, and uh, find a contact. Uh, we have a growing, we're a growing team now. So we have more and more people working at EMC. So they can connect with us. They can uh, send me an email, you know, info at emc-mec.ca. Uh, I'm always reachable. Again, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you had a lot of fun. Cheers. Oh, I did. I did. Thanks a lot. Very, very interesting conversation. I really appreciated that. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Think Energy Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review wherever you're listening. And to find out more about today's guest or previous episodes, visit thinkenergypodcast.com. I hope you'll join us again next time as we spark even more conversations about the energy of tomorrow.